right. Well, I also urge the, the chair to, to keep me on time. Because um, at, at risk of losing all of my time to my digression, I'm going to begin with a digression that was motivated <laughs> <laughs> that, that was motivated by the uh, discussion yesterday, and and you know furthered by Sir Hood's talk showing the the halo assembly bias and this factor two halo assembly bias, uh, as David said, it could lead to um, overall changes in the galaxy clustering bias. Um, and this is what we need to be worried about. But, but you know, these are numbers are actually pretty tractable, so I just you know, went through a very simple model. Uh, what, what is the effect on, say, an L-star sample of galaxies if this um, halo assembly bias exists? And you know, definitely, what is a better one? Stick. OK. Uh, you know, definitely, this is now pretty much, like I said, slam dunk. I am assuming something larger than what Surda actually found, that the, when you get to cluster size masses, there's a factor of two difference between the low concentration and the high concentration halos. Now, that doesn't have anything to do about the, the galaxies unless the galaxies, the number of galaxies, actually correlate with that halo property. right? So that is what's actually going to change um, the bias of our galaxies. So uh, if I made some model that says that, well, you know, once I reach some, some critical halo threshold, uh, this is where the, the, the clusters then diverge into a high bias population and a low bias population. And the maximal model would be that, oh, um, the maximal effect you can have is that all of the galaxies are in the high bias halos and there are no galaxies in the low bias halos. That's the maximum effect you can have relative to what your initial assumptions were about a mass independent HOD, right? Uh, and even in this ridiculous model, which is obviously ruled out because we detected those clusters, optically speaking, um, that's only a 1.7% effect at a redshift of 0.5. Now, if you as assume a more extreme model of assembly bias where this factor of two effect goes all the way down to 10 to the 13 solar masses, which I think is a pretty extreme model, now that's a much bigger effect. That's getting to be almost 10%. But this is, remember, the ridiculous model where you have entire avoidance of the galaxies away from the low bias clusters. Now, if you say it's just the satellites, because it's kind of ridiculous to say there aren't any central galaxies in cluster size halos, uh, if I remove all the satellites and say all the satellites, um, there are centrals, but there's no satellites in the low biased halos, uh, you know, it's a marginal effect here. And, and if you have the extended assembly bias, it's down to 5%. This is also ridiculous. Uh, what if, say, there are twice as many galaxies in the high biased halos versus the low biased halos? Now, this, I think, is easily ruled out by the data because the richness of these clusters is essentially the same, right? There was a very small difference. Um, and now you're at sub percent here for cluster sized halos and approaching a 1% effect in the overall galaxy bias for even an extended assembly bias model. And what I think would be a more reasonable model is that there's some slight correlation, say 20% more galaxies or more satellites in the high bias halos versus the low bias halos. And now you're at sub percent levels. Yeah, the, I'm, I'm just talking about, so, so, the one assembly bias that we know is, exists in, okay, modul okay, modulo all the discussion from this morning. Uh, the, the best evidence that we have for, for assembly bias in the real world, you know, is this something that we should be worried about? Assembly bias on cluster scales, I'm just saying that was not something that we really should be worried about unless we're gonna use the clusters themselves as, as tracers or cross correlators or something like that. If we're talking about the impact on, on say ELGs, it's gonna be even less than this because there's gonna be fewer ELGs in clusters. If we're talking about LRGs, then, then actually it'll be more of a problem. There could be some more like There could be. Okay. What if bias is a good advantage in some of those cases? I mean, if you if you set up some number level system and you you have to eliminate bias somehow, but but if you then do some you know, you I guess what I'm getting at is I I think that you need to be more precise in your assumptions and not worry about the bias so much that you can assume that you can
So that was. I did, this is not even my first time. Okay. Uh, yeah. I wanted this to. I want this guy. Yes. Do you want me to draw on the board? Most of the galaxies are not in the clusters. That was my original point. Yeah. Well, that's okay. It's 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 to address the discussion that you weren't here for because you were late. <laughs> you know, I I I said that, that this should have a minimal effect on, say, an alpha sample of galaxies, and then there was just said, well, you know, it could actually have a five percent effect. We just have to run through the numbers and see what it comes out of. Uh, you know, but it also depends on exactly what what you're trying to do with the cluster. Uh, all right, so. How much time do I have left now? All right, I'm going to run through and just skip all this you know, stuff that I want to leave no mode behind either, and I'm going to abandon all analytical models and go straight to using numerical simulations to emulate nonlinear clustering. Hopefully all you're all familiar with this thing called the Coyote Universe, uh, which was an emulator based upon numerical simulations for the matter power spectrum. It was 1% accurate. It's very successful, and I think we should be extending that. Uh, to emulating galaxy clustering and putting HOD models on top of these numerical simulations. So um, the purpose of my talk, which is I'm not really going to fulfill this purpose, but what's going to motivate work in progress, is to understand exactly how much constraining power there is at small scales, both a theoretical limit, which I'll show some slides on that, and practical limits when you actually begin to consider the systematic mm, effects of the things you're going to be measuring. Um, and now you have a whole wealth of statistics you can look at if you want to emulate them. You don't have to stick with the canon of, say, redshift space distortions or galaxy matter cross correlations. You can do something, things that don't have like uh, a closed form analytic model, like the void probability function counts in cells. The mass to number ratio of galaxy clusters is something we've looked at a lot. Um, and in this talk, I'm really going to focus on what you can get with nonlinear uh, redshift space distortions with, with uh, analysis of that. So. This now looks pretty familiar. Um, this is two-point correlation function now of BOS galaxies, LRGs. Uh, the points, the error bars are actually on those points. Um, they're just very, very small. That's five fits from five different uh, sigma eight values. Once again, all the lines are all there. They're just right on top of each other. The five different HODs, which created those five fits, reasonably degenerate. There's slight chi-square differences between them, nothing all that significant. But they make predictions for other statistics all those I listed on the previous slide. And the one I would concentrate here is the monopole of the two-point correlation function, uh, sigma naught, as a function of scale. Now these are the five different predictions from these five different HODs, normalized by the central model. And then the gray shaded band are the um, measurement errors you would get on the monopole from a BOSS-like survey. So it shows that you know these make different predictions for different cosmologies and that this right here from the 1 to 10 megaparsec regime, this is the sweet spot for measuring galaxy clustering. This is where we're going to have the best, um, most precise measurements. And so if we want to get the most bang for our buck for all the money that we're spending on these redshift surveys, we need to be able to tackle nonlinear scales. OK, so um, building the emulator itself. So I, I can't run an MCMC chain and have a new simulation at every single point in the MCMC chain. I still have to do some sparse sampling of my cosmological parameter space. So this is basically just following what was done um, in the Coyote universe. If I'm going to span, like, say, a five or six parameter cosmological space with 40 simulations, I start with, uh, like, a, a Latin hypercube design. So this is a first you know, run at a Latin hypercube. You basically bin this up into 40 bins here, 40 bins in each, basically 40 bins in each dimension, and you sample each bin only once. And then you run some optimization schemes to, to maximally space these out. Basically, you want to maximize the minimum separation between points. That's what it would mean to have a nice maximal spacing. Uh, but I don't want to cover lots of parts of parameter space that are already ruled out by, say, CMB data. So I just take this Cartesian n-dimensional space, and I transform it into the eigenspace defined by current CMB data. Right? So uh, this was now this Cartesian space projected into 
um, uh, a space defined by, you know, that encompasses WMAP9 and, and 2013 Planck data in omega matter and omega baryon, um, that the contours are the, are the actual CMB data, the points, the small points here are the projections now of what my cosmologies sampled are, and then these big red points, which I shouldn't have put on there, those are test points that we're going to look at in a sec, just to test that the, the emulator is actually working. So if we want to say, do emulation on BOSS data, BOSS is a big data set, it's like seven gigaparsecs. Does that mean that I now need a seven gigaparsec simulations for each one of my cosmologies? Because uh, that's a pretty tall order if you want to have really high resolution simulations. So one of the nifty things about emulation is that you don't actually, um, you get an upgrade um, based upon the fact that you understand the sample variance of your simulations. So here is the emulator simulations in omega matter sigma eight. Here are these test particle, or excuse me, the, the test cosmologies. Um, and if I run one simulation for each one of these 10 test cosmologies, they sort of bounce around the actual true mean because you know they're small, these are actually small boxes and so they're gonna have large sample variance. But um, if you use a, say a Gaussian process code to make your predictions in the space between the points, you take this into account. And the emulator predictions for this is now the correlation, the matter correlation function at 15 megaparsecs as a function of these cosmological parameters. And so the input to the emulator was one realization of a simulation at each one of these 40 cosmologies, and that'll bounce around a lot with this error bar, but the emulator prediction is much more accurate. And in fact, it's an upgrade, in terms of volume, it's an upgrade of about a factor of 20 in volume. So you don't actually need to run seven gigaparsec simulations to analyze a seven gigaparsec BOSS sample with the same accuracy as you would from the data. So, so I found, so, so the, obviously the sample variance decreases when I go to smaller scales, but I found that this factor upgrade was constant as a function of, of scale. So even though the sample variance went down to really small levels at say, you know, 0.1 megaparsecs, there was still, it was the emulator prediction was still better. And that's the way, that's the way, it, that's the way it should be. So, uh, so, yeah, better, so the, so the red points here, so the orange points are one realization, right? The, the red points, sorry I used red again, which I should not have done. So the orange points are one realization, the, which is the same as the input to the emulator. The red points are the mean of 35 realizations. Okay, so um, skipping over lots and lots and lots of details. Uh, I built a prototype emulator because I don't have access or at least finished um, product of a bunch of high resolution simulations. I built them with PM simulations, particle mesh. Um, and which, you know, don't do very good in terms of getting halo populations, but they scale with the cosmology reasonably well. And then on top of my cosmological parameter space, I have 11 additional uh, parameters for my bias model, including the HOD, spatial bias of the galaxies within the halos, velocity bias of the galaxies within the halos, and then assembly bias. And of course, this is really the crux of it all. And, you know, we can discuss how I've done that. I don't, you know, I don't obviously have VMAX for PM simulations. So what I did is my second parameter was large scale map, or excuse me, large scale density. So the um, halo occupation is a function of the mass and the large scale density um, around that halo. Ten. Yeah, yeah, sure. These are this is everything is in the halo. Uh, so th this is a 400 megaparsec simulation with a 600 cube particle mesh and 1200 600 cube particles and 1200 1200 cube mesh. So so the the profiles of the halos are pretty bad, but the mass function and bias function are reasonably accurate. If you look, you know, Jung had a paper on this and where we did a whole bunch of halo 
statistics in 2002 and basically compared to gadget simulations. And yeah, at, at, at when you get below, say, a few hundred particles per halo, you, you're not resolving as many halos as in a high resolution simulation, but the mass function's okay and the bias function is okay. So for these purposes, this is okay. It's not great, and obviously I'm gonna run this thing. Yeah, but that's coming from, so the, so in the transition region, um, around a megaparsec, that's where the effect of the PM simulations is most significant because you don't get very, you don't get as many close halo pairs. Now, it's smaller scales, that's inside the one halo term, and I'm just putting fake halos down and, you know, drawing, putting satellites randomly as NFW, SNF, NFW profiles with all these other bias parameters. Um, so, how much information do you gain when you look at Richard space distortions for the purpose of measuring F sigma 8 as a function of the minimum scale that you consider? So, in BOSS, in DR11, we had a number of papers that are using perturbation theory to get F sigma 8, and usually they go down to like scales, the minimum scale is like 50 megaparsecs or 30 megaparsecs. Um, and here is Lado Samashita's results from DR11, and it's pretty consistent with all the others in the sense that they get about a 10% measurement on, on sigma 8. Now, Beth Reed was using this simulation approach to do everything down to the smallest scales that we can measure in BOSS for the, for the Richard Space Multipole. Now, I consider this sort of more of a pilot study because there were a lot of parameters that she wasn't able to encompass. Um, but what she found was she could constrain F sigma 8 with a factor of four upgrade over looking at just the perturbation theory models at large scale. And if I now have my, my prototype emulator, I can just vary the minimum scale that I'm considering for the redshift space distortions. And basically, you get this monotonic trend that you always get more information when you're going to smaller scales. Now, this is the theoretical limit, so you know things like fiber collisions and things might might screw you up. Um, but that's you know the next things that we're going to be worrying about. And basically, um, basically, we end up sort of recovering the same result that Beth got. We got a little bit more degraded constraint on F sigma because we're marginalizing over more parameters. But you can break these, uh, the generacies between these parameters and the cosmology, especially the assembly bias, by adding in new data. So when I add in the void probability function, I now go to um, about a 1.5% constraint on F sigma from a boss like survey. So you can go beyond just measuring F sigma 8 and try and test gravity. So these are constraints now in sigma 8 and this growth index gamma, where the amplitude of the velocity field is approximately omega matter to the power gamma, 0.55 is general relativity. Um, and this just shows the constraints in this parameter space when you just have WP. Um, when you add in the redshift space distortions, and this is, you know, once again, marginalizing over the assembly bias parameters. And then when you add in the void probability function, which breaks this degeneracy between the assembly bias and the cosmology and gives you tighter constraints. I would sit on it for probably probably a year um, and and see if I can. I I would wait until I had done enough tests to believe it, and then I would believe it. <laughs> well, I don't know. I'd have to. First of all, I need to think up more. There are more. There. There's more data that you can bring in, right, to test. Um, and, you know, I would say, okay, now I need, a more, I, I, I need to make a more elaborate assembly bias model, or I need to throw away large scale density, and I need to see if I can have simulations that have Vmax, or throw in other, other assembly bias or assembly history things. Uh, and another. I gotta, you know, I, I gotta make sure that it's, that it, if assembly bias is the key to this, and I'm not even clear that it is, um, yeah. Well, the velocity is to be. Yeah, yeah. Well, 
Well, but I'm not. I'm not saying. I'm not saying that the galaxies have to move exactly like the dark matter. That's you know that is that is a completely free parameter. Okay, so uh, I, I assume that that um, the velocities, line of sight velocities, are Gaussian with a velocity dispersion which is independent of position within the radius, and that amplitude um, is some number times the virial velocity of the halo, and that number is a free parameter. No, no. Uh, so well, well, when I've looked, when I've looked at it before, um, in terms of the effect on redshift space dispersions, it, it is the same as simply taking that parameter and making that parameter slightly less than one. That that the internal, the internal, the internal velocity structure uh, can you know doesn't actually have that doesn't have a bigger. Well, I haven't tried that yet, um, but that's. Well, I think well, y if y if it makes a prediction for an HOD, like what the actual occupation is, you can test that, right? You can measure occupation in clusters, for instance. And so if, it, if, if, if like the thing that fits 0.55 is some totally wacky, crazy HOD, and I can say, well, that's obviously not right, because I can just look at clusters and see that that's, that occupation is not borne out when I look at clusters, or something like that. Well, I'm not, I'm not testing specific models. Like, I'm not saying I'm going to make a prediction for DGT gravity or something like that, right? But if lambda CDMGR works, then this should be 0.55. And if it's not 0.55, yes. Right, but, but. I consider the halo, the F controls the halo velocity field, and the things inside of the halos are just, you know, moving like the burial velocity times some parameter. There's no constraining what? Yeah, sure, but I don't, I don't care that. I don't, I don't. What, what, what does what constrain? I, well, okay, so I haven't actually had time to, to, to parse the chains to be like what scales are constraining exactly what parameter and what, par what, what data is constraining what parameter you know, and stuff like that. But I, I, I'm, I'm saying, I'm saying. Yeah. Right, and what, but what I'm saying is that, that, that if I predict the redshift space distortions for a model that has some complicated scale, you know, com some complicated velocity structure within the halos, and some model which is it's constant with radius, but I have some factor which can shift it up and down, the predictions are the same. That, that's what I found a long time ago, and I, I, I you know, for ex expediency purposes, that's what I did here. Um, you know.
I don't know. But that's a good question. Uh, all right, so you know, just repeating things that we've said, the best survey for, for this sort of thing would be something where your selection is pretty simple. So um, LRDs, ELGs, and QSOs, they all have issues. They may be more susceptible to assembly bias or less susceptible, it depends. Um, I, that's why I'm going to spend most of my time over the next few years working on um, something called the Bright Galaxy Survey, which, which Nikhil talked about. Uh, this is basically just like if you had your Sloan main sample, which is wonderful to work with in terms of halo occupation, just blew it up into cosmological volumes. Um, so the, the, simple, the selection is just going to be R band selected down to 19.5 over 14,000 square degrees, the median redshift would be 0 0.2. So you're going to have a volume bigger than, than boss low Z volume, but with a number density which is on average about 10 times as high. Right? So if, if you want to do the type of analysis at nonlinear scales that I'm talking about, having a high number density is really important to you. You don't really care about NP so much as being able to beat down shot noise at really small scales in the one halo term. Right? So just to hammer this home, th this is what Boss tells us the galaxy density field looks like in a narrow redshift slice, sl redshift along the line, uh, along into the plane of the board here, just a 15 degree by 40 degree patch of sky in, in low Z. And when we get done with, with the BGS, this is what it's going to look like. So it's going to be a wonderful upgrade in our mapping of the cosmic web all the way out to about a redshift of 0.4. This is a really, really good cosmological scale. Oh, so I actually use the, I use the, I use the, <laughs> those are black holes. <laughs> it's the actual boss mask. I made a mock and I used the boss mask. Um, so this is all, of course, as we have discovered through the questions, work in progress. There are a lot of questions that I, I don't know the answers to yet. But I want to acknowledge my collaborators because I'm not running all these simulations. Um, there are two versions of the first emulator um, in progress. Uh, one using gadget simulations run by Risa Wexler and Matt Becker. Um, these are using different phases for each simulation. And then another set of simulations from Daniel Eisenstein and uh, Lehman Garrison using their GPU code Abacus. And here we're using the same phases for each simulation, just to, for other reasons, but just you know, the, just to see what what difference it makes. Uh, and so these are designed for LRDs, just because the mass resolution requirements are a lot easier. And the next phase will be much higher res mass resolution, and we can apply that to the Sloan main sample, which is then a precursor for the WBGS. Um, okay, I hope I didn't go over time. <laughs>